and that became the basis of radio astronomy in this country. When I joined the National Re Effort, the predecessor to the uh, National Research Foundation in 1992, I found a project that my predecessor, the Dr. Ryan Arendt, had started. In 1988, he convened uh, all of about five or six senior astronomers in this country to come and talk about what the possible future of astronomy in South Africa could look like. Now, this is 1988. 1988, South Africa is still under apartheid. South Africa is still a pariah state in the world, even though scientific collaboration still uh, happened even during uh, that era. Not surprisingly, that meeting came out with a very modest uh, ambition uh, to move South Africa from a 1.9 meter dish to a 4 meter dish. Now, in 1988, you know that the Americans and the Japanese were building 10 and 12 meter class telescopes in Hawaii and, and places like that. But the Soviet ambition was quite modest, understandably. Uh, but it was clear at the time that, that there was political ferment in this country, that things are about to change, but we did not know exactly when that would happen. So I joined 1992, and we're chasing a four meter class telescope. We tried to get the Max Planck Gesellschaft to join up with South Africa to build this four meter class telescope but they were more interested in building a telescope on the Gunsberg in Namibia, uh, which, as you know, was a German protectorate at some point, not surprisingly. And essentially, the 4 meter class telescope project collapsed. Until David Buckley went to a conference in either Australia or New Zealand. Australia. Australia. By that time, I was now the president of the FRD, and David comes back and tells me that he's met some Americans at this conference, and they think that it's possible to build a 10 minute class telescope for the same price that we had thought a 4 meter class telescope would cost us. Yeah, David? Bring them in. And David invited them, and Frank Bess and Larry Ramsey arrived, and they, they sold us a story that is possible to build a 10 minute class telescope for $20 million. You're thinking a 4 meter class telescope for $20 million. And David, Bob Story and myself went into government and very quickly convinced government that that's the kind of project that South Africa requires now. Remember, this is 1996, 1996, 97. So the country is caught up in the spirit of everything is possible after 1994. So the timing of David's visit to Australia was perfect because there was a country at that time, point in time where nothing was too big, nothing was too ambitious. We're in the process of building a new society from the ashes of the old society. Therefore, why not? Why not go for the 10 million class telescope? The one mistake that we make, the exchange rate between the rent and the dollar at that time is five rents to one. And we got the government to agree to fund 50%. And my challenge was to go and raise the remaining 50% with David and Bob. And 50% of, of $20 million uh, was, was whatever the number was, but the time we built the telescope, that amount of money could only buy us about 30 percent of it. Yeah, 33 percent. <laughs> so we broke ground for salt in 2000. From the first meeting held in 1988 to breaking ground, it taken us 12 years. Different project, much bigger, uh, much more ambitious. The country was immensely proud. You'd walk through a supermarket, a, a, a shopping center, wearing a salt t-shirt, and people black and white, young and old, would stop you and tell you how proud they are 
that the country at the time saw it fit to build an optical telescope when it had all the socioeconomic challenges that it was confronted with. Inspired by that, Patricia Whitelock, who is not in the, in the room, uh, maybe she's online, I gave Patricia a challenge shortly after the salt groundbreaking. And I said to Patricia, it took us 12 years from the meeting in 88 to breaking ground for salt. What decisions, what choices do we make now that we shall break ground for 12 years from now? That led to the convening of a workshop. Uh, it was not five people, six people anymore. It was about 15, 16 days. And my, and remember I'm not an astronomer, my charge to that meeting was think big. We, we, have, we don't have the burden of thinking modestly the way they did in 1988. We have the benefit of the Mandela factor. We have the benefit of the delivery of the SALT project. So let's think big. It took Patricia a number of iterations to convince Justin Jonas to come to that session to put SKA on the table. He just thought that it was just way too ambitious. I mean, even for South Africa at the time, he thought it was way too ambitious. And Patricia and I convinced Justin, and Justin came, and he, he, he was really, really, he thought that we were kind of, now had not been invented then. <laughs> But he thought we were smoking something. <laughs> but in, in a sense, we had become equally confident and arrogant. Because, but, but, but we were driven by, by a sense that it was okay for us to have a bold, audacious vision for the future of humankind. Not the future of South Africa, for the future of humankind. And several people came, suggested what big projects we could think about, and all of them were too modest for my liking. I was still kind of, you know, having run around the world to raise funding for SALT. I just believed that if, 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 if it's a bold, audacious vision that we subscribe ourselves to, we'll be able to deliver it. And you guys know better than us. We now have 64 dishes, uh, uh, and, and South Africa was successful in bidding for the bigger chunk of hosting the SKA. And so hosting the GA next year, I think is partly recognition of the audaciousness of the vision. There's a statement that many of us Quote many, many times when we try to convince governments of the value and the import of investing in science and technology. And it's the Kennedy statement on the mission to the moon. And many people uh, choose to think that Kennedy was a science visionary. No, he was not a science visionary, he was a politician. The Russians had embarrassed the Americans politically. And America had to react to embarrassment from Sputnik. And so he had, and the, the, the way he was convinced to get back at the, at the Russians politically was said to send the man to the moon. But, but what many people miss in that statement, Kennedy did not say, we will send the man to the moon and bring him back alive. Kennedy said, we choose to. We choose to. So whenever you look at that statement, multiple underline the choice that was in that statement. And Savika made that choice. But that choice, when we went in even for salt, we knew we had a very small astronomy community in this country. And the telescope of that size 
in terms of time availability on the telescope was going to overwhelm the small number of astronomers that we have in the country. So from the get-go, from the beginning when we went to government to go and motivate for Sol, we're motivating for an African instrument, not South African instrument. Knowing very well then that we have even few astronomers on the continent. But that was our reality at the time. That was not the reality that we have locked into, into the future. And today, sitting here in this room with our African Society for Astronomy, uh, I think our vision was vindicated that this, it was a continental project. Uh, and SKA, as you know, even more so than SOP, is a continental project. It was an audacious vision that we came up with. And there's very few things that I've ever done in my life that I'm as proud of as the arrogance that I had to have that audacious uh, spirit. So as this continent, allow yourselves to be arrogant and audacious. Stop feeling sorry for yourselves. The past is the past. Shit happens in this world. <laughs> so let's deal with the past. Let's deal with how brutal it was. Let's deal with how unfair it was. But my goodness, the future can only be constructed by those who are here today. Thank you very much.